peace, truth, spirituality, healing, holistic health, aliens, ancient history, plant medicine, mysticism. If these words excite you, you're in the right place. Here, we seek to dig deep into all these topics and more. You, me, and my guests together. Welcome to the Enlighten with Alex podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to the Enlighten with Alex podcast with myself, Alex Dugan. Today, we've got our first ever international guest. We've got Brian Rice from all the way in the States. He lives in between New York and Washington. Uh, he's a cryptocurrency blogger. So we're going to be finding out a little bit more about crypto today. So welcome, Brian. Hey, Alex. Glad to be here. Good to see you. Awesome. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. So yeah, do you want to kind of just tell us a bit of your uh, backstory and how you've become a blogger? Because I understand it's a, a recent move. Yeah, no, I'd be, be happy to share. So I, my background is actually in, uh, or at least what I went to school for, right? We all, we all have that story. So I studied forestry and natural resources, which is one of those, those disciplines that takes you outside. And, and what I learned in the process was that um, you need technology in whatever you do, whether it's GPS systems, dealing with mapping systems, all the integration that you have there. So my, my profession took me into the government. I served in the government for 20 years and did all sorts of things in the US. Uh, was fortunate to um, represent the US at the UN on a couple different occasions, was able to travel overseas, all under um, natural resources, talking about forestry, land management, timber management, and, and seeing what was there. And when you think about that, and you think about cryptocurrency, you, you say, well, that's pretty far away. Like, what do you, how'd you end up where you're at, right? And, and what was interesting is I'd been working up in, in remote Alaska for a bunch of years, and I had a chance to come to, to Washington, D.C., to work in one of the headquarters offices. And so while I was here, right, all of a sudden you're exposed to all sorts of different things, both within your professional space and personally as well. And so I came across Bitcoin and that was in 2009, 2010, right? Which we all know. Well, very, very early. Very early. And, and I, like many, many, many other people saw it and go, this is really interesting. I don't understand it. Right. And so it just was one of those sort of far off topics that I knew about and I tried to understand, but it just took me a while. It took me probably four or five years to really get to it. So um, all that to say, like fast forward till today, uh, 2018, I, I had had enough. I'd, I'd wanted to do something different. I wanted to uh, enter a space where there was opportunity to engage technology and do things a little differently. And I started writing about cryptocurrency and it was not with any great uh, uh, master plan or anything like that, but I just started doing it and, you know, build from one day to the next. And here we are a couple of years later and uh, off we roll. So is that kind of to follow a passion more than to kind of move into a space that you saw up and coming or, or a little bit of both? I, both, I think, you know, Alex, I think the, the, the places where we as people really thrive is when we can connect the two, right? If you can connect the passion with something that, that you're doing, oh my gosh, right? There's rocket fuel right there. But all too often, we seem to be uh, very singular in terms of, or we have the duplicity that's there of, of doing one or the other, like, here's my job and my profession. I do it, I'm good at it, but maybe it's not my passion versus here's my passion. How do I, how do I sustain and support and, and be successful? And so this was uh, just a, by chance, one of the places where it started to come together. Yeah, yeah, it's a similar path for myself because I got made redundant uh, back in July because of all the COVID stuff. Uh -huh. in, in the meantime, I was getting some government money in between and uh, right. got into cryptocurrency then. And um, became really passionate about it, started investing straight away. And then, as you know, it's been a great year so far. And uh, now I've signed up onto Ivan and Tech's Academy to learn more right. about oh, crypto. Cool. So, yeah, 
really enjoying it. That's great. You know, I, I was thinking about um, some of the people that I've learned the most from. And even though I haven't done any of Ivan on Tech's academies, like I follow a lot of his content. I was actually watching one of his videos last night talking about his, um, his charting strategies, just thinking about how, because uh, you hear all these different phrases, right? The bowl, the teacup, the head and shoulders, the double, the double pump. And, and you know, for no, for people who've never been in it, you sort of go, well, what is, what does that actually mean, you know? And if you look at the candles on the charts and what that looks like, all of a sudden it makes sense. So, yeah, Ivan on tech is he's awesome. So it's, you'll uh, you'll have to share with us all about the academy and all those great things. Another yeah, time. I've only been in it about three weeks so far, so I'm just mm -hmm. learning the kind of beginner stuff. Cool. He actually uh, teaches a lot of the lectures himself, so it's great because he's always on a good vibe, isn't he? He's like right. always right. full of energy. And he knows he's yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that I find, especially in the crypto space, um, the energy of people and the, I would say the freedom that goes with it, right? The, the freedom that people just embrace to do things and, and um, it, you know, I mean, we can talk about the technology and we can talk about sort of the people side of things too. And I think on the personal side and the energetic side of things, the energy that someone brings to their passion or to whatever they do, right? What's, I mean, I'm sure we've all heard this phrase before, but where, you're, where your focus goes, that's where your energy follows, right? Or if you want to put energy into something, that's where your focus is going to be. And there are so many people within this space or within this discipline that their energy is there, their focus is there, their passion is there, and it just brings us to where we're at today. Yeah, it seems to bring out the best in people, doesn't it? It does, it does. I would also say that it also, um, like I, I don't necessarily think it brings out the worst in people. What I think happens is that because the, I always say the sideboards, right? Sort of the rule, the rules that we, you know, have whether it's being politically correct or or uh, recognizing statutes that are in place. Quite often, when those are unclear, people will naturally push to the edges of what they think is correct or or right, and and so I think we see that in a lot of places. Like if. Um, if you spend any time on, let's say, the Telegram channels, which is an incredible place to pick up information and learn on any number of projects. But I would venture to say that anybody who's spent any time on that platform has had uh, a direct message from a, a, a fake, um, uh, what do you call it, a fake admin from one of the channels, right? And, and you sort of sit there and go like, well, why? why are they doing that? Like, why is that happening? And, and so you have to get, you know, you have to be awake and recognize that, right? But also be able to, to be free about what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. Completely agree. And uh, you mentioned the fact that there's a great freedom that comes with cryptocurrency. And a lot mm. of people are talking about it in the sense of freeing humanity and moving away from the current corrupt, um, well, not completely corrupt, but parts of the banking system. Uh, would be seen as corrupt. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how you think that uh, cryptocurrency could help free humanity and bring back the financial system to the people? Sure, sure. I, you know, having, it's really interesting, Alex, like having worked in government and worked at senior levels in government, um, when you're, when you're in it, you it it surrounds you right it's it's part of everything around you and so um like my my personal view of when i served in the government was that we work for the people my my salary or my stipend or anything else was paid for by citizens of the united states and that my role was to serve them and i i i can say with great certainty there's a, a very high amount of people that feel that way there's others that it's a job. I mean, it, and it's, I think it's the same spectrum across the board. And so when I think about, if I take that paradigm and I think about the broader implications in terms of what is happening in the financial system, I, I have questions, 
right? And my, and my questions are around um, debt, right? So like, you know, depending on what set of statistics you look at, average consumer or average household credit card debt or unsecured debt or just the way people live beyond their means, to me, that raises a bunch of flags. Like I, I pay my bills every month. I don't, you know, I, like that's just been my mode of operation. And so there's part of me that asks the question, why do people do that? Is it a function of, and, and when I dig into that a little deeper, I, I'd say it's a function of all sorts of things, right? So there's a personal responsibility that people have to manage your energy and manage your state and be in the best possible version of yourself, which, you know, you could run down that path and say it's uh, health and wellness and exercise and all your relationships, right? To bring it back to the, the more bureaucratic side of things, I think there's a system that in place that doesn't uh, support the true will of the people at large, which I, I think you could interpret that in all sorts of ways. But what I think is that it doesn't necessarily reflect all the intention that's out there. And then in terms of the financial system, I see the financial system as a manifestation of that, um, I would say discrepancy in terms of people and intent, right? And, and then going back to, if you can, if you, the general you can create the parameters, create the rules, create those sideboards that we all live in, then many things can be manipulated or, or changed, right? So now, all right, that was a whole mouthful of topic. Now let's think about what, what cryptocurrency by itself means. We have this, this construct, this set of uh, reality as we perceive it now. And cryptocurrency has taken little tiny bits of that and completely put it somewhere else, right? It, it operates almost in a space unto itself. And now we see just within you know, the last couple months how large hedge funds, PayPal, uh, larger institutions are starting to reach out and, and whether they're trying to pull it back in, pull cryptocurrency as a whole into this construct, whether they're trying to reach out, whether a new path is being built, I think all of that still remains to be clear, but or remains to be seen. But the thing that I think is really clear is that where there is um, lack of certainty, there is opportunity, right? Because with, with that lack of certainty, like what's actually gonna happen? Nobody, in, in my opinion, nobody truly knows yet. I think we all have probabilities and ideas, but what does that look like on a much grander scale? I think there's opportunity for us to engage that and, and uh, materialize or manifest whatever it is that our future is gonna hold. Yeah, completely agree. And I think, in my personal view, it's kind of going to go in the way of we'll have a choice to either enslave ourselves further or become more free. So I think the government will start to bring up their own digital currencies. I think China already has, correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong. And I, I they're believe kind so. of be, are we going to buy into that or are we going to buy into these other currencies that are already out there that will hopefully you know, make things more fair for people? Right, right. No, I think that's... I, you know, when you think about cryptocurrency as a whole, or just you could say digital assets, right? Whether we're talking about actual currency, uh, digital currencies, or we're talking about non-fungible tokens or, you know, any other kind of representative digital asset, it just makes sense. Like when we think about, um, you know, I, I had to write a check for something the other, like literally a paper check the other day. And when you think about all the steps in the process that are required to move X amount of dollars from point A to point B, and the medium to start that process is a paper check that says, you know, please move money here, or there. And then you think about what a digital asset can do, where it's literally instantaneous. 
it's um, untrustable, right? Which I think is the other thing that's absolutely incredible, right? You yeah. want to you that's you want to see to me I heard recently to do with mm. Bitcoin. It's untrustable. Right, right. And at first, when you say untrustable, you think, well, gosh, why would I ever want to be involved in it? But then when you dig a little deeper and you say, I don't have to spend the energy to trust this. I just know that I don't have to trust it because it's immutable, right? And, and I had to explain this the other day. And, and um, you know, the way I described it was, imagine if your bank account, let's say you had $10 in your bank account, and uh, the only way that you could prove that to people was you had to have a ledger and you gave it to 10 of your friends and every transaction had to be recorded in all 10 of your friends' ledgers. And if none of them reconciled, it was void, it didn't work. And you could see the lights come on and it was like, okay. And for me, it was really helpful, right? As a person that writes about it and talks about it and is constantly trying to, share information and help people understand this, I thought, okay, well, this, this makes sense in that the understanding and adoption of cryptocurrency and what it actually can do, we're still way, 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 way back at the beginning, even though in the news cycle, Bitcoin's at an, nearing an all time high and, and you know, all these, just all these different things. Whereas the true understanding of it is still very much back it's almost like back at the 2009 phase, even though more people know about it. It's really sort of fascinating to watch all this play out. Yeah, it's crazy. Very exciting times. Like before I jumped on the call, I thought I'd just check the markets mm -hmm. and uh, add the hourly rate on. And XRP had done like 6% in an hour. Right. Yeah, some, right. some stocks won't do that in a whole year, were they? <laughs> it's fascinating. Oh, totally fascinating. Yeah, I was I was looking this morning, you know, it's over coffee. I take uh, just a couple minutes and, and peruse, you know, anything that's been happening and 30, 40, 50 percent within 24 hours. And and that that by itself is amazing knowledge. I think what's more fascinating even is when you look at some of the data behind it. So like, let's take XRP, right? Ripple. Um, just a few days ago, I want to say three days ago, XRP was trading at about 24, 25, 26 cents US. And um, it's not uncommon for uh, a digital asset to fluctuate 10, 15, 20% over the course of a trading cycle. And you can see it in the in all the, the candles and the charts, you can see the volume that's coming in and where the trades are taking place and the opening and closing levels. And if you follow, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's the one day chart, the six hour chart, the one hour chart, 15, five, one minute charts, doesn't matter what it is. If you follow those charts and you look at XRP over the last 72 hours, even week, you can see the classic uh, charting sort of emergences take place. So there's a head and shoulders, there's a teacup, there's a large bowl, there's an upside down, there's a double, and you sort of watch it and you go, okay, there's the double bump. So at the double bump, it should actually either break higher or it'll fall off the cliff. And there it was, it like started to move and it shot higher. I mean, it, it's sort of neat to watch it play out. And that's, that's backtracing, right? And while that's not 100% about what's going to happen in the future, it gives you a pretty good idea. Um, and I think there's one more thing uh, to keep in mind in all of it, right? Like you and I are sitting here talking about some of the some of the charts that go with XRP and some of the technical analysis. 90% majority say majority of people who are involved in cryptocurrency operate from their gut. They operate from a hunch, right? They look at things and they go, well, I think it's gonna like, you know, they watch the news and they see some article and it says Bitcoin all time high and they get excited and they say, you know what? Bitcoin's at an all time high. I'm gonna do great things. I'm gonna, and so that emotional engagement makes it really easy when you're looking at the charts because you know that the chart layout in a certain way that's driven by predominantly emotional response, which can be predicted most of the time, it leads you to the same conclusion. It's, it's really sort of awesome when you start getting into it. Okay, because I haven't actually studied 
um, trading and the, the tips behind that. I've kind of more looked at the long-term investing side. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was just going to say, can we just take it back a little bit? Because sure. I know a lot of my listeners won't really even know what Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is or what its benefits are. I know you mentioned um, how quick it is. And it's a digital asset. Do you mind just kind of telling us some of the, the basics? Sure, sure. You know, part of, I, I think sometimes a great way to, to think about things is to make it relatable, right? And so um, whether somebody has owned a stock or not owned a stock, like that part doesn't matter. I, I would say most people, I'll operate with the assumption that most people have at least seen in a book or an old movie, right? Someone has held a stock, right? Like a piece of paper that says, I own one share of Apple or IBM or, um, you know, HSBC, right, bank. Um, A digital asset is that stock, but in the digital space, like it's an analogy, it's not the exact same, but it's an analogy. So, so when you think about a a digital asset, when they were created, the intent was um, to have a, a, try not to use technical words, but a fungible, right? Something that can, a fungible asset, something that can be uh, assigned a value to that is able to be used across borders that doesn't rely on a third party that uh, cannot be hacked. And like, irregardless of whatever anybody says in the news, Bitcoin has never been hacked ever. What has been hacked are people's accounts, people have lost their passwords or their recovery phrases, whatever it is, right? But the actual code behind Bitcoin has never been hacked. And the reason why, it's like I was saying, remember, let's go back to that example. If you have 10 of your friends and you give them each piece of paper and it says, today my bank account is $10. And then tomorrow I call them up and say, hey, isn't my bank account, don't I have $11 in there? And they look and they go, nope, $10. And they check with the next friend, ten dollar ten, right? So when we go back and we look at cryptocurrency, these projects were created. All the projects today were created off of what's known as blockchain. So the actual technology behind Bitcoin is called blockchain technology, which means that every uh, predetermined amount of time, a block is created, and that block is a snapshot of the entire ledger, right? So. Um, and that that block is replicated across different nodes. And I know I'm maybe a little more technical there, but the nodes are all, those are your 10 friends, right? And those are all over the world. And therefore that information is in perpetuity. It's forever. It's immutable. You can't change it. You can update it, but once it's in there, it's in there, right? It's not like an Excel spreadsheet where you can, well, maybe I'll edit this column or I'll you know, change the formula. Like once it's in there, that block is forever. It's unhackable. And the other thing is it's fast. Um, so that was, the, that was the original premise behind uh, cryptocurrency. And then it's developed into many more things today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I find it really interesting as well with Bitcoin and I know a lot of other coins have a similar model is that they actually reduce the amount of coins that come into supply, don't they? So with Bitcoin, every four years, they halve the amount of supply. And actually, there'll only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. So that's another great feature, isn't it? Because that essentially means it's a deflationary asset rather than things like cash, which is inflationary. Correct, correct, right? With cash, um, and we've seen seen it in this last year. The central banks across the world are just printing money uh, to keep economies operating at a certain level. And and you know the financial and monetary policy behind all of that is, um, you know, le- like I said in the beginning, driven by so many different things. When it, when we look at Bitcoin, we 21 million. That's all there ever will be. Period. Right. Currently today, uh, I believe it's around 18 million, maybe 19 million Bitcoin are in circulation. And then uh, every four years, there's a certain amount of Bitcoin that (laughs) comes into the process or comes into the circulation. And then, but that number keeps reducing. So that's just Bitcoin, right? There's some other 
coins that have entered the market that have a deflationary component to them. So they start out with maybe several billion coins overall. And then every few years, those coins are actually, a certain percentage of those coins are uh, retired, basically. You know, you could say if it was money, it was burned, but the, the coins are retired, taken out of circulation for, for never to be included again. So that's also a deflationary. Yeah, it is a very kind of basic yet genius feature, I think. It's like you say, it it's like it, they're just constantly printing and printing, and then they've been like, hang on a minute, what if we made it so the supply was less, and therefore your asset, your theory should go up in value rather than be worth less and less because I think um, what a dollar could have got you 100 years ago to now is something oh, right. a huge difference I can't think of an example of the top of my head which uh, you... it's it's incredible I mean it, like you could take anything from uh, you know a, a gallon or a liter of petrol to um, you know if you buy milk at the supermarket I, you know even even in our lifetime you know I know from just being a young, young child and remembering things cost pennies and now they cost dollars. You know, it's, it's the number may be the same. There's just more zeros behind it. And so um, I think the bigger, the bigger phenomenon that perplexes me every day is, is um, the rate, the rate and how rapidly we have evolved. And, and, one of the examples that I think of quite often is when I was um, in university, um, I went to the University of Illinois, one of the you know, 60, 70,000 students you know, at a time. It was a huge school. But at the time when I went there, um, Apple was just started. I think the Macintosh was the, the computer that they had, right? And, and prior to that, like, uh, home computers. I don't think we had a home computer until after I was out of college, and you know things that we have, things that we have now in our devices, you know, were took up the size of our rooms before, and the rate at which we've had, uh, at least my generation, right, like the Gen Xers of the world, you know, that we've gone from minimal technology to all-encompassing, inclusive, integrated technology has been incredible or even my parents right our parents and all of this um and so to see that and then think about bitcoin and its place in this and when i say bitcoin i mean sort of generically cryptocurrency as a whole the place in there where cryptocurrency that's like going from no computer to computer in your home as it is to go from paper dollar or paper sterling pound to uh you know a digital token that you can't touch, see, feel, smell, but you know it's there. It's, it's unbelievable in so many ways. Yeah, yeah, it really is incredible. Um, so yeah, from let's move into the kind of investment side. Sure. Um, I'm guessing you're invested yourself. Where do you see the kind of price going over the next year? Because there's all sorts of speculation. Um, so yeah, just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that, um, so I think we're at the beginning of a bull market. Let me, let me start with some of the, the, um, the analysis that I've seen and that I subscribe to. So if you look, and this all hinges off of the Bitcoin having events, right? And um, you know, for folks that are listening, like, don't, don't worry if you don't know all the specific details about Bitcoin having, but so 2020 Bitcoin have 2016 Bitcoin halved, 2012 Bitcoin halved, and then, um, you know, back in the beginning, 2009. And so those events over those years, so especially 2012, 2016, 2020, those are three distinct years. If you look at the charts of Bitcoin during that time, you will see a near, um, can't say identical because it's definitely not identical, but the trend in the movement is unbelievably similar. And by that, I mean, you can see long timelines in uh, 2012, 2016, the times were a little bit longer, 2020, it's been a little protracted. 
but you can see these timelines in between when there was movement, increase, small sell-offs, movement, increase, small sell-offs, movement, increase, small sell-offs. And, um, and you can equate all sorts of things to it, right? I mean, you can try to tie uh, geopolitical issues to it. You can tie technology issues to it. I've seen um, Google trend data or Google search data compared to those different timeframes, right? And, and part of the debate is, well, is that apples to apples or apples to oranges, right? Because Google search capability in 2020 versus 2012, how different is that versus 2016, right? Um, overall though, I see an incredibly high trend or a, a highly resemblance of um, just the movement that's taking place. So that's just in Bitcoin. When we look at some of the other coins that are out there, some of the other altcoins as they're called, right? ALT coins, um, which is everything other than Bitcoin. If it's not Bitcoin, it's an altcoin. And what we can see there is the, the landscape has changed dramatically, especially from 2016 to today. So in 2016, many altcoins were still sort of in their infant stages, right? They were still being uh, developed. They were still operating on their test networks, or maybe they were operating as an Ethereum-backed coin. But today, many of those coins are now operating sort of in their own ecosystem and taking on their, their role. And more importantly, they're answering the questions that people have. For example, XRP, like we mentioned earlier, XRP, is looked at as a banking coin, right? So it's it's looked at as a potential, highly potential solution for a digital currency, right? A, a global digital currency. There's other uh, other projects that are out there, like V Chain is one of them that's looking at uh, looking at the supply chain across the globe, right? If you're wearing any kind of clothes, where does that material come from and where is it sourced? And so all of those that are out there. So I know I haven't gotten to prices yet, but it's like understanding sort of that bigger landscape is really important. It's really critical to sort of have a feel for what's going on. So um, I see trends that are very similar. I see we're in a place of uh, growth and accumulation. Um, Bottom line, I see prices increasing in the short term for sure. It's just a question of where the top's going to be. Yeah, that's it. Everyone's trying to everyone's trying to time it, aren't they? So they get out at the top. I think it's important, as I'm sure you'd agree, uh, to kind of take profits as you go. So you're not kind of risking taking everything out at the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think there's... Um, uh, even broader than that, I would say everybody needs to have their own personal strategy and whatever that is, right? Like, I mean, if, and it depends on your risk tolerance, right? Like, I mean, like you said, that first example, so many people are trying to say, well, you know, where's the top and when do I cash out or what do I do? Um, I just read a really interesting review by somebody who went through the last uh, sort of Bitcoin boom and he had I want to say it was just a couple thousand dollars that he put into Bitcoin and Bitcoin shot up. And I remember this is a trend we're seeing now. So Bitcoin shot up. So he cashed out of Bitcoin and said, well, gosh, I just made, you know, several hundred thousand dollars off of this particular tiny, tiny, like really small investment relative to what he made. Well, maybe I'll put it in some of these altcoins because these altcoins, Bitcoin at the time was $18,000. Mm. I can put that into a coin that's maybe less than a penny. And if that rolls at the same growth rate um, and he had increased his pool to $3 million off of just a several thousand dollar, uh, several thousand dollar investment. And he was doing the exact same thing that we're talking about. He said, well, gosh, you know, you know, if it can go to 3 million, it can go to 10 million. If it can go to 10 million, it can go to 20 million. So he rode the, rode the wave up, stayed there for a while, thinking about what he was going to do. And when everything came back down, he rode it all the way back down. And he actually ended up selling because he thought everything was done. And this was, you know, four years ago. He thought everything was done. And well, I missed my chance. So I cashed out. He cashed out for just about what he started with. 
and and that was it and and the the lesson in all that was if that's your strategy be ready for what can happen right if your strategy is to shoot for the moon just know you can be back on earth just as quick right so so the strategy then is take it in percentages take it in time you know if you need 10% or if you need to recoup your your starting capital place it aside put it back to wherever you want it um, or do it once a week once a month i mean there's none of them are wrong strategies they're right for the individual who's doing it you just have to make a decision and and uh, embrace it and support what you're doing because no one else is going to do it for you you have to do it yourself yeah definitely well you become your own bank don't you so you have to keep on top of it and yeah pick the strategy that works best for you and like you Mm. say about the cyclical cyclical nature of bitcoin and all things really the weather nature cycles it's all part of life isn't it and a big part of cryptocurrency cycles is the huge bull runs and then the big crashes off the back of it, which normally settles actually lower, I mean, higher than the start of the bull run. So you still be in profit, but you can also lose a lot of money that your friend unfortunately found. Um, so what, have, what are some of the risks of Bitcoin? Because a lot of people still to this day uh, don't really know what it is. They think it's a scam or they're scared they might lose everything. So what do you think some of the, the risks are that people need? Be aware yeah, of. that's a that's a good question because there's trying to allay people's concerns about cryptocurrency is really is uh, it's challenging, right? And and I get excited about it. I think it's really a fascinating, incredible, amazing opportunity. And you know, even people in my family have have uttered the words that you said. Well, I just don't trust that. I don't trust that digital stuff, right? I don't know and. And when you try to peel back and say, well, why is that? Why don't you trust it? Ultimately, it comes down to, I don't understand it, right? And so, so instead of uh, what I have found, instead of trying to say, it's great, it's amazing, it's an you know, incredible opportunity, it's not, and it's not just about upside, right? It's not like, I mean, everybody, of course, wants to be financially independent and financially free and supported. I see the benefits as much bigger and broader. It's being able to um, live in that environment, like you said, being unbanked and being your own banker and having, you know, instead of, it's like a modern day stuff in, stuff in your mattress full of, full of money. The difference is your mattress can actually create more money if you're, if you're smart about it. Um, Just put your ledger in there, can't you? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, but one of the things, you know, so when people are concerned about it, um, you know, the th- things I go back to what I said in the beginning, uh, Bitcoin has never been hacked. Like the code that uh, creates that digital currency has never been hacked. It's like thinking about your email, right? The only way that your email gets hacked is by someone getting your password and accessing your account. Right, so it'd be the same way if you had a bunch of gold bricks in your house. Nobody's gonna replicate your gold. The only thing that happens is if they get a key to your door and know what the combination to your safe is and have access to the room where your safe is, then they can get your gold. And it's very similar to that. And so even though you can't see Bitcoin, you can't touch it, those are the same kinds of issues, but it's really that that safe. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. The only kind of danger that I see myself is the um, regulation because they could potentially come down on it because it does sure. oppose the banks. Other than that, I can only see it just skyrocketing and the whole world adopting it because the technology is amazing, isn't it? It is, it is. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up. That was going to be the next piece I was thinking about. So the in terms of regulation, that's where... Um, it's really sort of the wild west still. And, and so with people who are concerned about it, um, even my parents have asked, have been really focused on that. Well, why, why would you get involved in this? You know, there's no regulations on it that, you know, they, 
And that's, you know, that's true. And, uh, you know, I say, well, I, I guess I better not walk down the street on the sidewalk either because someday there might be, you know, a requirement to do something specific there too. I think that um, with good intentions and with good focus and energy applied to it, I think that, um, you know, it things will turn out okay. And I know that sounds sort of woo woo, like, you know, think good thoughts and the world will happen. But at the end of the day, that's true. And if, if things come to a point where there's hyper regulation and um, you know the tax structures and all the things that go with it, it's identified as securities or not security, whatever that looks like, like we as people, we as, we as the human species, we will adapt, we will evolve, we will do what, you know, do whatever needs to be done at that time to, to reach whatever that next level is. Um, so I'm not too concerned about it, but it's definitely not something to put your head in the sand over either. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that we do collectively project um, like how we see things in the world, don't we? And if we all stay positive, and there's enough people behind the movement, which is growing rapidly. I can't see them sort of stopping that wave, really. I think um, it reminds me of an analogy. I think I think I read this on some of your content, actually. The uh, the one about the the snarling dog, right? So someone someone walks up to a, a dog that's near a tree, and the dog oh, is okay. snarling, and right teeth are shown. And the person gets really angry and thinks, why are you snarling at me? I didn't do anything to you. But then the person sees that the dog has their leg caught in a, a trap or in the wire or something. And so the anger that goes, why are, you, why are you snarling at me? I didn't do anything to you goes to concern and compassion and says, I'm, you know, I hope you're okay and can I help you? And, and the situation hadn't changed. Right, yeah. like the situation exactly it's, the same. Um, a Tara Brack quote, meditation teacher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Great quote. Yeah, I think a lot of people do kind of live in that fear mentality, don't they? It's like you say, mm -hmm. the resistance straight away. Be quite something new. I need to be afraid of it, and people can be very fearful of change. So I think it's important for people like yourself to educate people because, really, it's something that's going to help liberate us and maybe have more financial freedom and more freedom from the banks as a collective um, world society. I think, you know, one of the lessons I've had to learn in my life, Alex, is that um, the, the whole topic of, I, I don't remember the, the teacher who brought this up, but the, about the four different archetypes that we exude as, as humans, right? So there's the warrior, where you, you get things done at all costs, you're you know in everything's face. You you attack challenges head on. There's the magician who is more uh, methodical and and creative and doesn't necessarily need to be out front, but can find a solution. And it appears in a way that seems like you haven't done anything, but yet you've done it all. And then there's the lover where you're engaging and and you know intertwined and the relationships are so important. And then the, the sort of the sovereign or the regal, you know, the king or the queen, right? The person that approaches everything from a very uh, stoic pose. And, and so when I think about people engaging in Bitcoin, quite often the, the warrior archetype comes out, right? Like I have to figure out the solution right now because Bitcoin is, it's an asset and I have to treat it like a dollar or a stock and I have to be very, you know, direct. And what I would say is that when I have learned how to find a solution without going directly at the problem is usually when the solution is the most effective. And so by that, I mean, sometimes in order to get to the point where people want to focus on something, maybe it's your relationships at home, or maybe it's your health, or maybe it's your, your wellness or something else, right? And, and, you know, those are all different topics that we could spend hours talking about each one of them, right? Like, are you drinking enough water? Are you eating enough of the right food? Are you getting enough sleep? All those, 
And oddly enough, those are the things that will actually lead us to a place where our, our thought and how we manifest ideas about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and, and all the other projects associated with it will all come to this place. And you sort of go, wait a second, I wasn't even focusing on Bitcoin. I was focusing on all, all these other things, but now I see Bitcoin in a totally different way. And I think that, that that's the key in terms of trying to help and serve other people and and provide the education or the knowledge information that goes with it to get there. Yeah, I completely resonate with that because I got into spiritual and personal development about, I don't know, three, four years ago. I was a bit of a lost puppy before then. Uh -huh. um, I feel as if by raising my vibration, if you like, over those years, I kind of feel like cryptocurrency came to me. I mean, working on my mental well-being, my physical well-being, my diet, everything like that, and healing emotionally. I think that's kind of led towards this path, if you like. I'm not saying you have to do that to end up in crypto. I just feel like, you know, it's a vibrational match. No, I, I agree. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's not the requirement, but man, for me, it sure helped. And, and you know, everybody's, everybody's journey and everybody's path is different, but it's all the same. You yeah. know, whether, whether um, you know, for me, I, I had come from this very rigid, uh, bureaucratic, rule-driven environment where, um, you know, if you had a question on how to do something, there was a manual for it. And even, even if, and like my challenge was, I always thought there was another way even beyond what was printed or written down or accepted. And, and so that creates conflict, right? And, and so for anybody who has their own business or anybody that works in the corporate environment or anybody who's an entrepreneur by, by how they do things, all those environments are very different, but they're all very similar because maybe if you're an entrepreneur and you have thoughts, well, maybe I, I saw somebody do it this way. So I think that's how it should be done. That vibration is the same vibration as if you're in a corporate environment and there's a strict code of conduct, or if you're in the government environment and there's a hard and fast set of rules you're giving yourself limitations. And so being in a place that you can expand, expand your vibration, expand the, the consciousness, expand your rules and thinking about how you do things, um, it'll lead you to where, wherever it is you're trying to go. In this case, we're talking crypto, but it's, it's applicable in so many other areas. Yeah, 100% agree. And I think going back to what we said earlier about fear, a big part of it is kind of, letting go of fear because then you're just so much more open when someone mentions something exciting like crypto instead of kind of curling up into a ball and being like oh no you kind of be right. like okay cool what's all that about tell me more yeah yeah well and, it, and it's what i find fascinating about it is like the fear is like what is the fear really rooted to is the fear really rooted to money or is it something else and ultimately at the end of the day everybody that i've talked to who who has concern about crypto, it's really about losing money. Like, I don't want to be scammed or made a fool of, but then you can go even deeper. Like, okay, so what? So you lose money. Are you still able to clothe and feed yourself? Do you still have a roof over your head? Do you still have family that loves and cares for you? Do you still have all these other things in your life? And I think it goes even a step deeper than just losing money. I think it has to do with, fear of being wrong or fear of losing um, connection, right? Some people would go as far as say fear of losing love mm -hmm. from, from those who would, who would normally give you that, that gratitude or that appreciation for, wow, you did great, you made all this money. It's really not about the money, it's about the energy that's behind the money. Yeah, it's, I think generally speaking, we're very attached to our ego and our self-identity and how am I going to look to other people if I lose all my money or I've been um, buzzing about this technology and then it's gone to crap and now it's stupid. Right. No, I think, yeah, you said it more succinctly. It really, it ultimately it comes down to the ego and how people's ego, how they are ego driven as opposed to more soul driven. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So what kind of practices do you use to, uh, for your mind or maybe do soul practice as well? Do you do meditation or anything like that? 
So I do a handful of things. So I, um, so I have a, a rebounder and I have like every day for Is 10 minutes. Is that like minutes. the little trampolines? Yeah, yeah, those yeah. little, the, the small round trampolines. And I tell you what, like my, I think my parents had one when I was really little and I didn't know what it was. And, you know, I just thought it was a trampoline. You go jump on it. And um, I have one and I use it religiously. Every day I've got a timer on my watch that's set to 10 minutes. And it's one of the first things I do in the morning. Usually I let the dogs, take the dogs outside and then I'll come back in and I set my watch to 10 minutes and I just bounce on the rebounder. And it's not... Uh, like if you see somebody jumping on a trampoline, right? They're jumping feet off the ground. Like my feet never even leave the ground, but it's just constant move, movement. And so it does a couple of things. One, it circulates your lymphatic system, right? Because your your lymphs don't have a your lymph nodes don't have a pump to move everything through. So gravity helps force things through. So it helps with uh, your immune system. It helps with your energy movement. Um, the other thing that it does, which is really sort of fascinating, is it helps center your left and right hemispheres of your, of your brain. And quite often when we're not in synchronicity, we're either left brain or right brain. And we, we, we show those, you know, we're either very analytical or we're very artistic. Like if we go back and forth. After 10 minutes on the rebounder, I am laser focused. I mean, it is unbelievable. So here's an interesting thing about the rebounder. I know that there's more here, but um, so my father is visiting and my father's never done it before. So my mom's the one that had it when I was, had the rebounder when I was little, but I didn't, you know, I figured they both had it, but my father's told me like, no, I've never done that. I don't know what it is. And my father has always been a very um, deep thinker like very he'll he'll think and think and think about things before he says anything you know he's not one to be slight of cheek and say things you know without thinking about it so I said hey dad come over here and try this and you know he's in his he's in his 70s and so he gets on and he's just bouncing just nice gentle bounce three minutes Alex I'm telling you three minutes he looks at me and he goes, what is going on here? What have you done to me? All of a sudden I can see clearly. And it was, it was fascinating, right? And I've, since then I've had more and more people say that, but so rebounder is one thing. Um, I'm sold, I'm gonna have to give it a go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's great. Uh, the other thing I do, um, I practice Wim Hof breathing. Uh, I think um, I love all that. And I love it. I came across it probably a year and a half ago and I didn't know too much about it. And I, and I tried it and the breathing is, is great. I mean, you spend another 10 minutes. That's the other thing. Like I try to do things that are not hours and hours because I've done that before. And sometimes my mind wanders and I do, diff, you know, I just, so 10 minutes. So it takes about 10, maybe 15 minutes there. And then the last thing I do um, I don't take a total cold shower, but I always have a cold rinse at the end of every shower. And it's, it just snaps things into picture really quick. And so it makes between- makes you very those, alert, doesn't it? What's that? It makes you very alert, the cold oh, showers are comedian. Completely, completely. Um, very similar in uh, outcome as the rebounder, just different. Cause the, the cold, the cold water um, makes you, makes your, um, your blood vessels, your capillaries and everything constrict and then warm them up and they release. And so it has a very um, sharp effect, but that's, and it, you know what it took. And I, I'll tell you what, like for folks that are listening to this, like Wim Hof has a, a free app for your phone and he's got like three or four different free things. Like I think he still has, it. it's like a cold shower challenge, right? So it, it you know, first day, 15 second cold rinse, right? And you do that for a week. And then the next week you do a 30 second cold rinse and you just build up to it. And after about the third week, I was hooked. I was like, man, I've never, I'm never not going to do a cold rinse again, unless it's just not available. And it's been, it's been great ever since. There's a bunch of other things I do, but those are probably the three big ones that are the most, most helpful. Yeah, I know there's a lot of mental and physical benefits with that. Do you ever do um, nature swimming in lakes or anything? 
You know, I, I used to, especially when I lived up in Alaska um, all the time, as much as I could, especially, you know, being on the intercoastal region. That must have been um, cold, Alaska. It, it was cold. During the summertime, it's lovely. During the winter, it's cold as heck, but um, not so much around here where I live now because the waters are pretty dirty and, and I, most people, like most people that go swimming end up with uh, ear infections and <laughs> all sorts of problems. <laughs> yeah not not good is it not good so yeah um we've talked about actually let's talk about how we met because we're both in the conscious crypto circle yeah uh, christoph fantastic group that we kind of paid to be involved with him involved in he gives us lots of top tips and also kind of spiritual tools to help us as well on there and uh, we've talked a lot in the group well christoph has about investing into making the world a better place if as we expect these investments really pay off um i know you've worked in the environment set to yourself and whatnot if it does go as planned do you have any plans um, or dreams that you'd like to bring to the world or businesses yeah no that's a great question you know i think first um on the in terms of the the, the group um this is the first mastermind group that I'd ever been a part of. Like I'd, I'd been parts of, you know, I have professional peer groups and things like that, but in terms of um, a mastermind group, um, you know, if, if anybody ever reads Napoleon Hill's book called Think and Grow Rich, which was written over a hundred years ago, right? So if you think about somebody early 1900s, early 20th century that, um, was writing about the power of peer groups and peer groups that are focused on a specific outcome, not because most of the time peer groups are this thing of, well, you and I are at the same level, or maybe we're both uh, alternative media, or maybe we're both bloggers or podcasters, right? So therefore we should connect. But his focus was peer groups that come together for a purpose. And I never, I thought I understood it, but I, I didn't understand it until I joined this group. And I, the power of having a group of, of dozens, if not hundreds of people that are all focused on um, raising the vibration, raising the consciousness, doing better in the world, doing good by the world, serving others. Um, it's so powerful. It's so incredible. And the thing that's even more incredible about it is that it brings together people with all sorts of different backgrounds, uh, skill sets, perspectives, uh, temperaments. I mean, you name it, like every one of us is different, but yet we're all pointing in the same direction. We're all saying, I want to do good in the world. And here's a way that we can grow and develop the resources to actually do that. So I think in terms of working with Christoph and this group, it's like unbelievable, right? And we're early into this too. We haven't even, we haven't even done it yet. Um, assuming, assuming that <laughs> believing that we are on this path and that we're gonna be in a place to um, provide for our families. I think the couple of things that I've been thinking about, two things in particular, one is that um, providing a, uh, an unbelievable childhood for the kids and my nephews and nieces, right? So for the next generation coming up and helping them, and we've already done it, like that's the other thing, like whether, uh, how, how this all plays out, like the, we're already starting the conversations about how they think about the future, how they think about money, how they think about engaging with other people, sharing love, raising vibration. I mean, it's, it's there, so that part, then the other piece on probably a more organizational standpoint. Um, when I worked in the government, I spent a lot of time flying across the country and flying to other countries and working with my counterparts and other governments. So I was able to see the ground from a, a high altitude. And, and I can tell you, flying from the Eastern coast United States to the Western coast United States, you go from very uh, urban populated areas to very sparsely, you know, it's where all the agricultural land is. But the thing that you see 
is you can see the original forested uh, tracts of land and you can see where the agriculture has chipped away at all of them, right? And so I've always thought that there is a place for uh, reforestation to happen in ways that is sustainable, that doesn't impact agriculture and food supply, but yet does things in terms of carbon sequestration and, and uh, you know, just all the things that forests do for the environment in terms of habitats and, and for people as well, right? Because that's the other thing, like go for a walk in the forest and everybody feels better. Like the trees are incredibly powerful. So that's, those are the two areas that I, I'm focused on sort of beyond uh, what we're doing now. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Um, I'm actually having a child, my first child in May. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Huge, huge thing exciting. for me. About to, yeah, make sure I can provide a good future for them. And then uh, me and my girlfriend have both got the same dream, luckily, to build an orphanage somewhere like Nepal. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'd kind of do. I think long that's time. that's amazing you know have you have you been to nepal have you you traveled yeah. there yeah i actually scattered my dad's ashes up everest i didn't get to the top yeah, uh, yeah. just above base camp yeah oh that's amazing so i i didn't say this in the beginning but uh from 1998 to 2002 i served as a peace corps volunteer in nepal and wow. so i so i lived for two years uh, down in the southern part of the country near Duran, uh, or, uh, uh, Sunsari district. And then the next two years, I was up in the hills, uh, Sunko Asaba district near Kadbari, which is more the Makalu region. It's the next uh, spot over from the, from the Everest region, but it's, uh, Nepal's an amazing country. And oddly enough, there's a lot of, a lot of movement in cryptocurrency in Nepal right now. Yeah, it's funny, actually, because uh, one of our guides was a yogi, and he taught us yoga a couple of times a day on the way up. Great guy, got to know him quite well. And um, he actually sent me a link to this crypto app before I got into it properly back in May. It's uh -huh. called Pi, and you can actually mine for the coins on your phone. And I think oh, the, yeah. the guys are doing it out in Nepal. Yeah, that's one of them. And then there's... Uh... I, I would call it a Twitter alternative. It's called Rebuzz. Yes. Um, and that particular social media platform, I don't think it was created in Nepal, but it's predominantly used in Nepal, like majority of the people that are on it. There's a, a large Australian contingent and then a huge Nepali group of, uh, that are using it. It's, it's really sort of great to watch. Awesome. So yeah, you've traveled all around the world. Where else have you lived? Um, so I lived in Nepal. I did quite a bit of work in Brazil, Mexico, uh, some work in Australia. Um, and then after that, just traveling for work, you know, European countries, uh, Tanzania and Africa, every continent except for uh, Antarctica. Yeah, it does seem to be a common theme within the kind of conscious space, people that have traveled a lot, because I think it opens your eyes to the fact that we're all similar aren't we? we're all one basically yeah you know when you yeah it's it's unbelievable to to travel to different parts of the world and you know the way it's portrayed in media or in you know whether it's tv radio social media it's portrayed differently but when you're there on the ground like people people have the same the same worries the same challenges the same fears the same uh joy right it's love uh, family, you know, basic needs every day. People want to laugh and be entertained. I mean, there's all sorts of similarities and, and it's the how is a little different, right? Just, but that's, once you see enough of it, the theme and the trend is what shines through. It's not the how, it's not a different brand of car or a different style of clothes, right? It's, it's that, that energy that goes with it. It's sort of amazing. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like if you show people respect, more or less anywhere you are, you will get it back. Show right. Respect. Oh, it's so true. That's so true. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So, yeah, we'll kind of head towards wrapping it up now. What I like to do a bit of fun just before we finish is sure. um, give us your three dream dinner guests. I don't know if you saw this on my other pods, but <laughs> I haven't seen it. So, what is it? My three what? 
three dreams in a guess. It can be from the past, present, could be a celebrity, could be someone you know. So three dreams, like three dreams of who yeah. I'd like to meet? Yeah, yeah. So say if you're having dinner tonight and you can have any three guests you want, basically. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, you know, one person uh, right off the top of my head, Abraham Lincoln. Like it always, and I don't know if it's because I've been in Washington, D.C. for or the, the area for a little while now or you know, having seen Ford's theater and then read a lot of American history, I've always been drawn to some of his, his work and his writings and just some of his thinking about how to do it. So uh, Abraham Lincoln would definitely be one. Um, I think there's a handful of other ones. I think that, um, you know, Gosh, there's so many to choose from. Because right when I was going to say one. Um, Lincoln's a good one. How, how is the atmosphere over there, by the way? Because obviously, there's been a lot of controversy around the election and whatnot. You know, it's, um, it's interesting. It's really, I think, I mean, granted, I'm in a more urban area. Um, so in, in being closer to the capital, you, you, you tend to feel more of the politics and, yeah. you know, people are like, it, I like to run, I jog quite a bit. And so I, I hear groups of people as I run by, you know, like on election day or the day before the election, I think I heard more times I heard somebody say, that's outrageous. This is unbelievable. Like all these things of like astonishment and disbelief. And so, um, so I think the, the tone is divided still. I think this, there's still a lot of division that's here. And I don't necessarily think it's from one side or the other more so. I think it's both. Well, the, the problem is the two very different ideologies, aren't they? And it's the yeah. most contested election ever. Didn't you have the most votes of all time? Right, right. Yeah, no, most votes. I mean, that's, and that's the thing, right? So for whoever walks away with it, uh, you know, it looks like one person has it now, but um, whoever walks away with it, like, everybody needs to realize there's a nearly equal number of people who came forward and said, no, no, I stand for this other ideology. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. and it it's feels like amazing. to me, just from what I see in the media, obviously, I live in the UK, most people vote for the one guy more out of hate for the other one rather than actually yeah that yeah, guy. yeah. Really which sure. then creates that just creates a crazy rift in sort of the energy lines right like if people would actually just say here's here's where my focus is and this is i'm giving my energy to i think it could end up different but yeah that that's how kind of politics and the media work there isn't it it's like scaring people out of the other guy rather than right. focusing on what their guy's going to create and bring to the world. Yeah. yeah I know. So I think, I think there's two other people. I go back to that first question because it's such a good one, right? So I think um, I would like to meet uh, John F. Kennedy. That's another one. And I, I didn't even really, is it, it's the person that comes to mind, right? So I got two presidents. I think those are there. And I think the third one would be Gandhi. Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, yeah, because yeah. I think just in terms of having lived in Nepal, and when I lived in Nepal, the first two years, I was only maybe five, six kilometers from the Indian border. So everything, even though I spoke Nepali to the people I worked with, everyone around me either spoke Hindi or Bhojpuri or, you know, some of the other local dialects. And so I, and then I had a chance to travel all over India. And I, it's an amazing country. So I think Gandhi would be the third one. I think that would make for a really interesting dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully to go you into politics then. Yeah, apparently, apparently. I didn't realize that, but. Yeah, no, I love Gandhi. His movie, the one with, um, what's he called? Ben, uh, ben Kingsley. Ben Kingsley, yeah. yeah he's one great. of my favorite movies that is. I think, you know, I think the thing, more so than the politics, it's the, the leadership. That's yeah. what I saw in all of those, right? Like, um, 
you know, Abraham Lincoln went against the grain and like did something revolutionary in terms of, of changing the, the course of this country. I think Kennedy was on track to do that and he was stopped short. And then Gandhi, you know, forever changed how we look at things. And, and it's, uh, it's interesting that they all got murdered. These people that wanted to change the world and make it a better place ended up getting right, right. crazy what we do. <laughs> It is. It is. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I wonder what they'd uh, they'd be doing now if they're still around. Eh? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, uh, talking about Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gandhi would be like buying all his Bitcoin. Be the change you want to see in the world. Right. Oh my gosh. Never That'd be it. great. Yeah. India is another place where where cryptocurrency is sort of, you know, it's like one minute in the news. It's it's going to be outlawed the next minute the news you know it's adopted so it's 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 a very provocative uh sector to be involved in yeah i suppose it's a bit more complicated because here in the uk we're obviously quite a small country but in the states in india you've got like 50 states in both countries or whatever, whatever it is and you've got to kind of manage each one and where they want to go Right, right. Yeah, I know that, you know, all the states in the United States, like, um, you know, some of the states that are coming forward as being more friendly to cryptocurrency are some of the states that you would be, that seem, I wouldn't have expected it. So Wyoming, right in the center of the country, oil and gas state, very uh, in mining, lots of mining in Wyoming as well so very resource focused and they're you know coming forward you know saying bring us here bring us your bitcoin we want you here texas is another one that's starting to pick up traction as well which is really surprising and then some of the smaller states but uh those are the two big ones right now i've heard a lot of good things about texas lately i've heard like a lot of people are moving there because it's kind of up and coming and... It, it might be it might be i um it yeah it depends i mean there's texas has really been an energy an energy capital of the country and um there's you know they always have a good football team good american football team but do they? <laughs> i don't know too much about that who's your team out of interest oh you know i grew up rooting for the green bay packers in wisconsin but other than that that's that's about as much as i follow yeah. It's too many more there's too many other interesting things in the world to pay attention to yeah yeah definitely i know what you mean i know what you mean so cool is there anything you want to sell or any final comments as we leave or and i'll leave some links below yeah yeah no you know um this is great like this having a chance to talk with you and share information is really really awesome the only thing i would add is um my I have a blog in two places. So one is on publish OX, publish zero X.com. Um, so the Bri Rye method. So Brian Rice and B R Y R I. And I've started migrating a lot of that over to my own blog site. So it's Bri And uh, I don't have anything to offer as of yet. And part of it is because I'm just, I, I'm doing this out of sharing and, and wanting people to do well and do good and share as much information as I can, but that's a great place to, to start to, to keep up. Yeah, definitely. I'm actually doing a webinar on cryptocurrency next week, just for beginners, just to teach them the background and oh, how cool. to buy it and whatnot. So I'll, uh, I'll mention your blogs on there, just so people okay. have got somewhere to look. The, that'd the, be great. That'd be, yeah, that'd be great. It'd be really helpful because especially on the Publish OX site, um, there's every article, you know, it's everything from wallets to staking to um, specific currencies yeah. that I'm just looking at. Cool. So yeah, check those li links down below, guys. And uh, it's good to check out Brian's blogs because, you know, it's from a heartfelt guy. There is scammers out there like any industry, isn't there? So you have to uh, look for reliable sources, don't you? Yeah, there are. I, I would say it's, you know, I, we've all gone through it. Like those of us who've been in this space for a while, um, it's easy. It's easy to see something like you go onto YouTube and see a video and there's uh, go to the comments and you'll see what's there. Like maybe the comments about Bitcoin and you'll have people 
typing about any other number of currencies saying, hey, check this out. Hey, look at this, or this one's going to do great, or, you know, this one's going to the moon. And, and you read them and you just think like, what, what are they doing? Like, what are people saying? And, and, and it goes even further than that, though, right? Like once you engage, people will start to engage you. So it's sort of double-edged sword, like crypto space is really great because people engage, but the nefarious actors also engage. So just go in eyes wide open and, and everyone will do fine. Yeah, I got stung with one about three years ago, a coin. Really? Uh, did you hear of Das coin? No, I didn't. It's changed to something called Green Power now. But yeah, it was basically like a huge bit of a pyramid scam. Uh, that was my own fault, not researching it properly. Once I had, it all kind of made sense. Um, a friend had recommended it. So yeah, I would just say to people, any coin you're going to get, make sure you research the hell out of it and make sure it's legit. Yeah? You know, one of the things, I know we've talked for a while here, but I think there's... Um, something that i would i would add in as we're thinking about cryptocurrency and sort of how you um how you engage it right and and part of part of the approach that i take is really um every coin has a website right and and sometimes it's really in depth and sometimes it's just a splash page but the the coin will have a web Sorry about that, guys. A little bit of uh, Wi-Fi issues. What were you saying, Brian? Sorry. Yeah, no worries. You know, I think um, so. Every project will have a website. They'll also have a white paper, and the white paper talks about the genesis of the project and why it's there and what the intent of the project is. And then from there, um, I would go to a handful of different places, right? check the, all the social media handles, right? Facebook, Twitter, typically they're pretty active on Twitter. Telegram, check it, but I would not spend a lot of time there because that's where it, like, it, it's good just to reference material. Then there's any number of other platforms, Reddit, Bitcoin Talk, um, even LinkedIn in some regards. And then check some of the review sites and uh, like there's review pilot and a couple other ones. And you'll see, you'll get a sense for which projects are respected and doing well and which ones you want to stay away from. And then the other side of it is don't hesitate to reach out to people, especially if it's a small project, because typically the teams are pretty small. They'll have a person that sets it up, an operations person and a community manager who's more of the person that connects all the social interaction and they'll they'll engage for the most part like it doesn't matter if you're you know senior senior person reaching out or just somebody that's interested like they should engage with you because that's what this community is all about and so spend a little time to do the research and it'll help you out so much more in the future yeah 100 percent. there's a huge community isn't there and it's very friendly everyone wants to help each other out so good vibes yeah yeah yeah. Totally. Thank you so much for coming on, Brian. It's been great chatting. Yeah, this is great. Your insight. And yeah, put a, put a face to the name. I've seen you hosting the group a lot and helping people out. So yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for the time. And I uh, hope it was helpful for everybody that's listening and look forward to, looking forward to hearing more of your content. This is great. All right, cheers, mate. Nice one. All right. Okay.